Your body is a fortress crafted through millions of years of evolution. And I don't mean just your fists or your teeth. The little things like your skin, tear ducts, and even the hairs in your nostrils are all designed to defend you. That's because they're protecting you from even tinier things, pathogens, the microscopic organisms that make us sick. You might have heard of them in vague terms like bugs or germs, but the small world of pathogens is actually incredibly diverse, sometimes weird and often pretty dangerous. And in this episode, we're going to get to know that world really well, from the little creatures that live there to how our bodies protect us from the ones that could make us sick. I'm Party Sabetti, and this is Crash Course Outbreak Science. In our last episode, we saw how looking at infectious diseases from a microbiology perspective can help us understand and tackle outbreaks better. To a microbiologist, the roots of disease are infectious agents, the microbes and large molecules that are transmitted between larger organisms, like humans. To be more specific, it all starts with pathogens, which is what we call the specific infectious agents that can make us sick. Pathogens tend to be microbes like bacteria, viruses, protozoa, and fungi. There's a huge variety of pathogens out there. We need a whole other series to describe them all. But in general, they all have a few key features that help biologists tell them apart. Let's find out who's who. First up are viruses, which are made up of fragments of genetic material, wrapped in a kind of coat made of proteins. Unlike most other pathogens, they don't have cells. And depending on who you talk to, they may not even qualify as living things. That's because they need to infect a cell and use its resources to reproduce. I'm team living thing myself. They do this by latching onto a host cell, injecting their own genetic material into it and taking over the cell's functions to multiply. If they attack enough cells, viruses disrupt the workings of our organs, causing us to get sick. Smallpox, the common cold, flu, Ebola, polio, and COVID-19 are all caused by viruses. Wow, that's a lot of diseases. That's part of why we often focus on viruses and outbreak science. Our next microbe, bacteria, do have cells. They're single-celled organisms. But while other kinds of cells keep their genetic material inside a nucleus, a bacteria's genetic material is wrapped up in circular loops that float freely inside them. Not all bacteria are bad. There's friendly bacteria, like the ones in our stomachs that help us digest food, and the ones we use to create fermented foods like kimchi and yogurt. But the pathogenic kind are much nastier. Once inside the body, they can kill your cells through direct attacks or by creating toxins that paralyze them. Other kinds of bacteria multiply so rapidly they damage entire organs. That's what the bacteria that cause diseases like cholera and tuberculosis do. Protozoa, the next microbes on our list, are a little more like us. They're single-celled organisms, yes, but they're eukaryotes, which means they have a nucleus like our cells do, and they're undoubtedly alive. When they get into our bodies, they can harm us in ways similar to how bacteria can. One of the most widespread infectious diseases, malaria, is caused by protozoa carried by mosquitoes. Then there are fungi. These are your molds, yeasts, mushrooms, and they're also eukaryotes. Some are made up of single cells, some are multicellular, some are harmless pizza toppings, and some make us sick. Fungi release tiny cells that can reproduce on their own called spores. Certain kinds of pathogenic spores travel easily in the air where they can stick to our skin or be inhaled. During an infection, fungal cells multiply, growing into places they shouldn't and feasting on the cells they infect. Fungi are responsible for certain skin diseases such as athlete's foot and ringworm and other unpleasant things like oral thrush. Finally, there are a few pathogen oddballs like parasitic worms. Unlike the others, they're animals, animals that live inside people by feeding off what they eat. They can even grow large enough to be seen by the naked eye. I won't mince words here, it's pretty gross. So let's move on to the equally weird and fascinating prions. Prions are just proteins that have ended up folded in the wrong shape. It doesn't sound like a bent out of shape protein would do much harm, but they can be seriously dangerous. If they come into contact with other correctly folded proteins inside the body, those proteins become misshapen too. Those newly misshapen proteins bend other proteins out of shape and so on, damaging the organ they're part of. That's why we consider prion diseases infectious diseases. Prions can be inherited or consumed in certain kinds of food. One example is Kreuzfeld jakob disease, or mad cow disease, which occurs in the brain. Okay, that sounds terrifying, but luckily prions are super rare. Microbiology is a pretty large field and we've skimmed a lot of the details, but it should give you an idea of the many kinds of pathogens that might enter the body. The question is, how do they do it? On close inspection, the human body has a lot of holes. As I mentioned in our last episode, science demands clarity. So there's no shying away from the details here. Some of the holes in the body are obvious, like your mouth and your nostrils. Others aren't as apparent, like your tear ducts, ears, 
anus, or genitals. And although your skin is quite a good barrier against pathogens, tiny scratches, wounds, or bites can create holes too. All of these holes are the roots pathogens can take to get inside you. For example, pathogens can be transmitted by direct contact with an infected person's skin or bodily fluids, which is often the case for sexually transmitted infections. They can also be picked up from the surfaces we touch with our hands and enter our bodies when we later touch our eyes, our mouth, or our nose. Or an infected person might release droplets containing pathogens when they talk, cough, or sneeze, which then get inhaled by someone else. It could even be more straightforward. Some pathogens find their way into our food and water, which we unknowingly put straight into our mouths. Others, like malaria, are carried by animals known as vectors. Vectors are typically blood-sucking arthropods, like mosquitoes, ticks, and fleas, and when bites us to feed, they're basically creating another hole through which they transmit pathogens directly into our bloodstream. It seems like the drawbridge is wide open for invaders as far as the human body is concerned, hardly the most well-protected fortress. But your body has a whole host of features to defend you from pathogens. Together, these features form the immune system. It all starts with physical barriers, which prevent pathogens from entering in the first place. Skin physically stops pathogens from getting into our bodies. What's more, it's slightly acidic, which prevents bacteria from growing on it and our sweat contains enzymes that break down bacterial cell walls. Our eyes are similar. Our eyelashes and eyelids physically prevent airborne pathogens from reaching our eyes, while our tears contain antimicrobial compounds that kill anything our eyelashes miss. Other potential entry holes into our body, like our nostrils, lips, ears, genitals, and anus, are lined with mucus, which physically traps pathogens, stopping them from getting any further into you. And though it might spread disease if we're already sick, Coughing and sneezing can eject unwanted material from our airways that contain pathogens. Finally, we can eject microbes out the other end. Every time we use the bathroom, we're also flushing out lots of unwanted microbes from our systems. These physical barriers are like the walls, turrets, and moats of the fortress, providing a first line of defense. But should any stubborn pathogen manage to break through, the second line of defense kicks in, the innate immune system. This system has dedicated cells that attack any trespasser, so we'll call it a non-specific barrier. Monocytes cruise along your bloodstream, looking for anything suspicious, while macrophages and dendritic cells keep an eye on your tissues. If they find something, they can digest the intruder, and macrophages will eat anything dangerous looking, even tattoo ink in your skin. When a macrophage begins its fight, it calls for help by releasing proteins called cytokines as a distress signal. At that point, tougher cells like neutrophils and natural killer cells, yes, that's their real name, will swoop in to help destroy tougher threats. So the cells of the innate immune system are like the guards of the fortress, well-trained to neutralize most enemies that make it beyond the physical barriers of your body. But occasionally the body needs a more specific approach in tackling a pathogen and calls for special forces. That's where the adaptive immune system comes in. Unlike the innate immune system, the adaptive immune system is highly specific. Its cells target distinct pathogens and continually well adapt to be stronger the next time. Two important members of this specialized team are the B cells and T cells. B cells are a type of white blood cell that creates antibodies, which are special custom-made proteins designed to stick onto one specific pathogen. If an antibody binds the pathogen it's looking for, the body triggers an immediate immune response to rapidly destroy the threat. That can look like blocking pathogens from getting into our healthy cells or making pathogens clump together, stopping them from infecting more cells and making them easier for other immune cells to eat. T cells also look for specific pathogens, but they do it a little differently. While B cells and their antibodies seek out pathogens directly, T cells recognize our own infected cells. When they find one, they call in reinforcements cytotoxic T cells and helper T cells. Cytotoxic T cells are in charge of destroying the infected cells, while helper T cells coordinate the rest of the response. They help B cells produce antibodies by nudging them into action or releasing cytokines, the protein distress signals we talked about earlier. Our adaptive immune system has a secret weapon that gives us an advantage against repeated infections from the same pathogen. It remembers pathogens it's seen before, so it can recognize them more quickly the next time. When T cells or B cells are exposed to pieces of a digested pathogen, they can specialize into memory cells. This process is called immunological memory. Memory T cells are like historians, documenting the invader's attack and storing that data in our body's long-term memory. Memory B cells, meanwhile, hang out in the body after the first immune response ready to spot the pathogen and make antibodies quickly if it shows up again. The adaptive immune system is like an elite guard of soldiers and military intelligence that strategizes to defeat the more serious threats to your body. And it's this system that we take advantage of when we make vaccines. They help our T and B cells recognize a particular pathogen and prep to defend our bodies against it without making us seriously sick. 
We'll be talking about vaccines in more detail in future episodes. Unfortunately, even with all these remarkable layers of protection, sometimes things can still go wrong. Pathogens are often sneaky and have multiple ways of evading even our strongest defenses. Sometimes we do get sick or even get sick multiple times from the same virus. Our immunity also varies from person to person. So what makes one person too sick to get out of bed might look like it doesn't affect the next person at all. Our immune system can even overreact to something that isn't actually a threat, like a particle of pollen. In that case, the body will start up the immune response, releasing the same cytokine distress signals it normally would, which can cause inflammation and swelling. You might already know this process by another name, allergies. In the case of hay fever, it may just be annoying, but a serious food allergy, for example, could cause anaphylaxis when the throat swells up so much that you can suffocate. Similarly, an autoimmune disorder like multiple sclerosis is when a body is essentially allergic to itself and the immune system attacks our own healthy cells. On the whole though, the immune system does a remarkable job fending off the many kinds of pathogens it faces. Understanding these threats and supporting the immune system is a crucial part of tackling diseases during an outbreak. Individual bodies are just one part of the picture. In our next episode, we'll be zooming out to look at how when groups of people change, the way diseases affect them changes too. We at Crash Course and our partners, Operation Outbreak and the Sabeti Lab at the Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard, want to acknowledge the indigenous people native to the land we live and work on and their traditional and ongoing relationship with this land. We encourage you to learn about the history of the place you call home through resources like native-land.ca and by engaging with your local indigenous and aboriginal nations through the websites and resources they provide. Thanks for watching this episode of Crash Course Outbreak Science, which was produced by Complexly in partnership with Operation Outbreak and the Sabeti Lab at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard with generous support from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. If you wanna help keep Crash Course free for everyone forever, you can join our community on Patreon.